This is Tales from the Pros, where business leaders and influencers share their stories of inspiration, struggles, and successes. And I'm your host, Michael Giorgio. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Tales from the Pros, and this is Michael Giorgio, your host and co-founder of Imagine Ovation. My wonderful guest with me here today is a serial entrepreneur, investor, and founder and CEO of Gupshop, the world's leading messaging and bot p- platform used by over 30,000 developers that handle nearly 4 billion messages per month. Gupshop also developed Team Chat, a smart messaging app that introduced structured templates to messaging. He also previously founded and led Elance, the pioneer of online freelancing, and which is now known as Upwork, and is also a publicly traded company. Please welcome Birud Shet. Birud, I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much. This is awesome. Michael, thanks for Michael, thanks for having me here. Really appreciate it. Yeah, a- absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. So, you know, uh, Birud, you know, I I can relate a little bit to you. I, I you know, I've obviously done some research on you and your background and your story and. and and um, I really like what I've seen. And uh, obviously, you've accomplished a lot. And you, you've seen a lot of successes over, you know, lots of hard work, many years of hard work. Um, and, you know, the, the, this podcast really tells from the pros is, um, you know, it's really focused on, on business storytelling. And I love in your interviewing founders such as yourself who have been through so much and really experienced the whole, you know, um, uh, process from startup to even an IPO and all of that, right? So, that's where I really want to um, I, I want to get started here is is if you can tell us a little background on how you really got to this position where you are today. I'm sure many people have asked you that before, but just in a, in a you know maybe a, a short few minutes, how on a high level did you did you reach where you are at least right now? Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. A lot of hard work and a little bit of luck, right? <laughs> uh, uh, everybody needs that, but uh, no. Just to back up a little bit, I think uh, you know, just a combination of all your experiences. Uh, it's uh, you know, you take a a problem solving approach, you take a growth mindset. You know, you have to learn, you have to scale. Uh, you need an intense uh, work ethic. Uh, you're always on, uh, and and so on, right? Um, you're you, you have to be a good listener. Right, you have to listen to what the market's telling you, what the competition's telling you, what investors are telling you. Uh, when you're too close to something, you lack perspective. So the outside-in perspective from others uh, helps. Uh, customers, in particular, tell you a lot of things about your own business. So it's important to listen. Um, and then when opportunities present themselves, right? Call it luck. Call it you know uh, market changes, things like that. You have to be open to them aware of it uh, uh, or the converse, right? Sometimes when bad things happen, like an external financial crisis, I mean, no fault of yours, but when that happens, it really shakes up everything. So you just have to be open to, you know, you have to be dynamic, nimble, agile. And then um, I think perhaps the, the, the most difficult thing really is just grit and determination and perseverance to sort of stick it out, right? I think uh, because even in the, uh, uh, for the, <clears throat> you know, as I mean, the the common joke in Silicon Valley is, you know, some like say in my case, Upwork was an overnight success 20 years in the making, right? It just takes a really long time. And I think it sounds glib after the fact, but while you're going through it, right? Those, those years really, you know, they age you, they, it's a grind, it can be difficult and so on, but, but it's not, you know, I'm not complaining in the sense that, you know, if you really enjoy it, you're in it, you know, then the journey is itself the reward as much as the destination and so on. So I think we can, we can unpack each of these things. There's a lot of things that go into it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I think it just, uh, you know, some of the elements that I mentioned. Yeah. And um, going back to Elance a little bit, uh, giving, you know, uh, web, let's just say web development, um, mobile development, freelancers, the opportunity to find jobs and all of that, right? Uh, That was back before 2000, correct? Oh, yeah, that was, uh, well, we started in December 98. Uh, That's right. Wow. And 
did you at that point really see a problem in the market? Was that, or just, you knew that there was a gap? Were, were there not many platforms at that time? Is that where you thought you kind of would enter into the space or were there some com competitors and you just thought you could do it better? Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, we were preaching uh, remote work uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and, you know, I was joking with some of my co-founders that not that I wish the pandemic to happen, but if it had to happen, where was it 20 years ago when we needed it to evangelize remote work? But today we all take it for granted, the benefits of it and the adoption of it, right? Uh, but, uh, but 20 years ago, it was very challenging. I mean, people would say, no, you know, I, do, I can't trust somebody who I can't meet face to face. You know, how am I going to pay them? What if they run away with my money? What if they don't, you know, work in the same time zone I do? What if they, you know, don't understand or speak my language, uh, et cetera. I mean, there was just all of these, honestly, there were just mental barriers really, but, but for a business, it can be challenging as you're evangelizing these things, right? So, but I think at that time, um, you know, what I saw really was, it's just a combination of my own uh, personal influences really, right? Um, for example, I just, you know, I, I grew up in India, in, in Mumbai, I studied at IIT and then came here for grad school at MIT. Mm -hmm. I was doing computer science and then I did a short stint on Wall Street. I was a, a bond trader, uh, if you will, right? So uh, there were like three, so I was, I was in my 20s, right? So my limited life then I had uh, my, my three formative influences really where I came from India and I knew that there are a ton of smart, bright people all over the world in India and elsewhere, you know, Brazil, Turkey, you name it, because uh, so, uh, so you, you have a, a global talent pool. Uh, the other is with my studies in computer science and so on, you knew that internet was, was making it easy to connect with anybody anywhere, yeah. right? And then the last thing was sort of given my Wall Street experience, I knew you could create a marketplace even for um, illiquid securities or unstructured items like services, right? When you want to see, it's one thing to have a marketplace for products where everybody knows exactly what it is, right? But but when it's a service like web design, web development, um, how much does it cost? Well, it depends on what the scope is, right? So anyway, these three influences sort of, you know, were just sitting in my head and my co-founders then we were just brainstorming. Uh, and really, you know, it took a, I mean, even just going from sort of a, an inspiration to an idea and refining it, what categories, how does the product work, you know, what could break, you know, how do you protect the buyer, the seller, uh, and, and so on, right? And then even once you get past the product, how do you market it? Um, how do you get people around the world to hear about it? How do you get businesses here and so on? So I think, uh, but really just seeing the fact that, you know, you have these massive paradigm shifts happening. And literally uh, the way I like to think of it, say, describe it as, you know, you're really just connecting the dots, right? Uh, and the, the, there's a saying, right? The future is already here. It just unevenly distributed. So if you, if you just see that these things are happening and should happen in much bigger scale and you sort of get on with it, you build something that enables it and drives it, makes it happen. I think that's how, you know, that's how we came up uh, with Elance. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think you, mention a lot of great points of you, Rude. I, I, you know, I know many people can learn from you, uh, learn from this story. And uh, I, I, and this is just my opinion. I, I think there's a big problem uh, with a lot of startups because uh, I've dealt with hundreds of startups where actually I can relate to um, Elance a little bit or Upwork because uh, so we, we actually own a, me and my brother-in-law own a um, app development technology company for the last 10 years. Um, so we, we can definitely understand about trying to find new developers and new resources. But, um, you know, I, I think th there's a there's a stigma out right now that it's, you know, oh, oh it's uh, it, it kind of like a lot of these startups, they think it's easy to start a business because they see all these things on Facebook and Instagram and they see all the, the good things, but they don't realize the work and the grind that happens behind the scenes, you know, and. I think that's a big problem. And I, I like how you mentioned before, you know, it takes, uh, it, it was a startup over after 20 years, you know what I mean? It just took so long and it's a lot of, it's a very long process. It's rigorous. It's um, a lot of trials and tribulations, a lot of making mistakes, learning from them, ups and downs. And, um, I, you know, it's, it's just really good to 
to let people know that, you know, it's, that's not really the, the reality of it is to have something successful. It takes a lot of trial and error and it takes a lot of um, hustle and, and, and perseverance and resilience. So, you know, for you, when you uh, be rude, when you were growing Elance or even, um, you know, the, the company you have right now and, uh, you know, Gupshop, did you experience the same types of obstacles in growing both of those, uh, you know, SaaS companies, or was it very, very different? Did, was it a lot easier for you to grow Gup Shop than it was for you to grow Elance because you had all that experience? Oh, certainly. I mean, look, you know, um, one is the external ecosystem keeps improving, and then of course your own experience set uh, keeps uh, increasing as well, right? So both of those make a huge difference, right? And let me elaborate, like on the, uh, like I remember this was in the late 90s. In fact, we started in, you know, because I was in New York uh, on Wall Street. Uh, we, the first year of Elance was literally in, in New York. We started in a two bedroom apartment. I mean, it was hard to get even a lease, right? Uh, because the landlords would ask us for five year lease with substantial upfront deposits because they're used to all these Wall Street tenants who could easily do that. And as a startup, I mean, you know, we didn't even have a planning horizon, didn't yeah. go beyond like three or six months. So, you know, just, but, but a lot of these basic things have changed now, right? Certainly New York is a, is a great hub for, for startups and so on, but just basic things like that, or even employees uh, not understanding how compensation works in startups where this cash is lower than Wall Street firms, but equity is higher and that's where the real value is. Um, onto, uh, you know, uh, the tech infrastructure, right? And back at that time, you had to buy expensive servers and databases and host it and maintain it and manage it. Now everything's on the cloud. Uh, it's pay as you go. It's instant, you know, and very cost effective to get started, right? So, so in a lot of ways, the external ecosystem has changed. Uh, I think uh, employees, the talent pool is much wiser about equity, wealth, and so on. Uh, so that's on the external side, I think, on the... As a, as a personal journey, of course, you know, uh, again, I think uh, what a lot of people don't realize is the, the psychological journey of an entrepreneur is a very significant part of the overall success. And, uh, you know, it just needs a little uh, a mental fortitude to deal with the roller coaster ride, you know, the, the high highs and the low lows, right? I think it's really uh, and you just have to be even keeled about it, uh, deal with it, be open-minded, be flexible. Uh, when something doesn't work, uh, you know, and sort of getting discouraged, you sort of really get into what didn't work and why, and what did we learn from it to then improve on it and get better. Uh, because, you know, tech startups in general, you're operating in uh, uncharted territory, right? You're trying to push the limits, the frontier. Right. And once you just accept that, then inherently, you know, the, the only way to innovate, the only way to get forward is to try certain things that are risky. There's no guarantees of success. And therefore, when it fails, again, it's not a personal failure. It's really just, it's part of the process, right? So you kind of, but just use it to keep getting uh, better and so on. So I think certainly as a, you know, you have experience in dealing with employee situations in you know, being, uh, and you have more credibility, right? So I think it helps uh, fundraising becomes easier, uh, you know, recruiting becomes easier, uh, dealing with board dynamics. Uh, you know, I think, I think, you know, you anticipate, you sort of, you know, you're not just reacting, you have a little bit more control over what you're doing and so on. So yeah, makes a, makes a huge difference, certainly. Uh, I mean, I look myself as a rookie entrepreneur, there were a lot of mistakes uh, I made. And again, I don't regret any of them because they helped me grow and learn. Uh, but but for new entrepreneurs, they should learn from others' mistakes as much as they can so they don't have to make their own. Yeah. That's exactly right. You know, and, and let's go to uh, Gup Shop a little bit. What made you, and I'm not sure if you have any partners, but what made you really start that that company? And I know it's uh, it's pretty big in India, right? Have you guys, is it also, you have, you have a, a lot of users here in the U.S. as well and all over the world with that platform? Uh, yes, we are we are expanding globally. Okay. Uh, now, and you're going to see more of it happening, certainly in the U.S. and elsewhere, LATAM and other places as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I generally, you know, I've had uh, co-founders at Gupship as well. And usually I found that, you know, uh, new ideas usually work well with teams uh, you know, uh, because you need different perspectives. No one person can uh, have 
you know, uh, I mean, building, it, it's like, uh, you know, building, building a startup requires a combination of skill sets that's really hard for anyone to master. Uh, so teams often tend to work well and better. Um, you know, really it was the key insight was if you're building mobile uh, services and you want to reach billions of users, uh, really the only way at that time uh, was through text messaging or SMS, right? Because that's the lowest common denominator, works on every mobile device, and you can build rich services to communicate with, uh, with billions of users, right? So that's uh, what we started with, and we set up a cloud messaging platform that enterprises can use to send uh, notifications, alerts, reminders, you know, uh, things like that to consumers. And um, of course, you you know, every time you uh, do a banking transaction or you shop on an e-commerce site or book a flight or book a hotel and so on, uh, or order food or a taxi, I mean, you get these notification alerts, you know, and in the US, some of it is on email, some of it is on text messaging, but in the rest of the world, it's almost exclusively on mobile messaging. Uh, so it's a very, very high volume. And, um, you know, so we, we, we are one of the largest platforms actually in the world uh, with, in terms of volume of messages. Wow. And um, uh, we handle, actually, the current count is about six, seven billion messages a month. So fairly sizable traffic. And uh, yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's what we do. And, and the great thing about messaging now, so previously it was just text messaging, but these days now you have newer uh, IP or internet protocol based messaging channels emerging, right? You can now, enterprises can send messages through WhatsApp to consumers, right. um, or even we've launched something proprietary that we call GIP, which is short for Gupshop IP messaging channel, right? The point is in all of these things, now you can have richer messages with images, with uh, cards and buttons and conversational experiences, chatbots, AI enabled chatbots and so on. So, so messaging and bots are becoming sort of this new uh, capability for businesses to engage their customers. Uh, it almost becomes the new sort of digital front door, right? And uh, the analogy I like is in the mid nineties when websites came about, every business had to go out and build a website because that's how customers were going to find them. And now, you know, uh, every business is going to have to go out and build a conversational experience because again, that's how consumers are going to, you know, reach out to them and find them and so on. So they can use it for marketing, for sales, for customer support, uh, you name it, but that's the big opportunity. Yeah. Cause now it really is about conversational marketing. Uh, it's not just about, you know, just sending a message and that's it. A lot of it is about interaction. So, um, you know, I can definitely see the, the, obviously there's a very big demand and I can see why you've uh, received a lot of, um, you know, successful traction on, on your product and, and your application. Um, yeah. You know, b Reed, I want to talk about what it's like to scale a SaaS company, software as a service. Um, some people that I've had on the show, they have service-based businesses. For you, it looks like, you know, you're running a, more of a SaaS type company. How have you been able to really scale it to a point where, the, the top line is, is increasing, you know, your ARR is always increasing, at least for the most part. I don't, you know, I, I'm not, I won't talk numbers. I'm not a, I'm not a big numbers guy by all means, but just more an essence of the, the, the elements of scalability. How did you scale your business and even Elance to get it to such a thriving company um, to get recurring, re, uh, recurring users and revenue on, you know, on the platform? Cause that's not easy to do. I've met so many, uh, entrepreneurs and I have a lot of friends that do own product-based SaaS companies and it's uh you know it's it's not that easy it's, it's it requires just heavy marketing and and sales and um and just the way you operate your business so if you can dive a little bit into that that'd be great sure yeah absolutely I think uh you know it's sort of there's there's different uh sort of tactics or strategies at different stages of growth right I mean in general, uh, I think right in the beginning, it, it's a lot of it is around product market fit, right? You have the right product that customers would like and use and so on. And even in our case, you know, we had to evolve uh, quite a bit uh, because initially, you know, we were using this messaging platform. We were running a consumer service, but for a variety of reasons, we couldn't uh, subsidize it and monetize it and so on. So anyway, then we flipped to an enterprise product and started offering it to enterprises. 
So we had the scale, we had the technology, but the enterprises needed um, a few features, right? So that's where you have to listen very carefully to the customers, right? They need uh, the ability to, uh, to send messages in a certain way, receive reports, API integrations, all these capabilities. So some of that was, um, you know, so you to just really listen carefully, uh, do some trial and error around features, offer it, see if it fits well or not. That's the first aspect of it, right? Uh, the next aspect then is, uh, you know, what kind of SaaS, right? There's a lot of it, these are subscription SaaS models, ours is a consumption SaaS, okay. right? Uh, so what that means is as businesses use more, they consume more, they spend more, and therefore, you know, we can have, uh, even without new customer addition, even existing customers can drive revenue growth, right? So so it, it now it depends on the kind of business model and what it is, right? So if the value you're delivering uh, can be a consumption-based model, then sometimes that might that can be better in some scenarios, right? It depends. So, so the very design of the business model and pricing can have an impact. Um, I think uh, uh, beyond that, uh, you know, customer success is a really critical part of it. Uh, making sure that new customers are onboarded correctly, and uh, and you know, consumer adoption sort of uh, or customer adoption of our product typically goes through. Uh, stages, right? So, so the first is they get adopted and understand the tools. Then they they use it for one or two use cases. Then they do it for a few more. So there's really onboarding happening at every stage. It's a sort of a continuous onboarding, uh, so to speak, right? Because there's there's newer capabilities, uh, sort of as they call it, land and expand, right? Once you have a customer, you expand the in, the interaction, the engagement with right. them. Uh, so that's important. Uh, I think customer support is also important when things are not going well. If people have issues, complaints, they have queries. I mean, we can enhance that, improve that, and so on. I think that makes a big difference. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know, uh, re and uh, uh, infrastructure. I think technology infrastructure is a very critical part of it. You really have to invest uh, a lot in it because even the least bit of outage uh, can cause you know, loss of reputation, it can be, have a significant impact. So I have to be really careful um, with, with that as well. And, uh, and lastly, I might add is just, you know, constant innovation. I mean, you have to keep bringing new ideas to the table, uh, things that the customer is hearing first from you. And often, you know, we found uh, consistently that, uh, you know, even if uh, customers were not willing to switch, let's say if they have a competitive product, they may not switch for, because once they get settled in, the switching, you know, people don't switch for no reason, uh, but they, but when there's a new thing that you're offering that others are not, then they're willing to try your system and then even switch the older uh, product as well, right? So in our case, for example, we are, uh, we are the pioneers of IP based messaging and a lot of customers that may not use us for text messaging would, would, would use Gupshop for IP and then also migrate their SMS traffic to us. So it's really, you know, they have to see you as, as uh, leaders, you know, as like stable, reliable, great feature set and, and good innovators. So each of these things, and, and then of course, you know, uh, the, the power of, uh, the great thing about SaaS businesses is the power of compounding, right? So sometimes it may look like slow growth, but over a few years, it, it just, adds up and you know if you're growing at 30 40 50 percent uh, year over year i mean once you look at it after five or ten years i mean it just becomes an insanely large number so a little bit of patience also is required you know? yeah yeah no, that, 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 that's awesome you know and part of your scaling journey be rude did you i mean from what i uh, uh, read and understood it looks like you guys did get uh vc capital and vc funding as well as part of the, the journey, is that right? For yeah, yeah, well, at uh, sure, at Gups, I mean, at both companies, right? At Upwork and at Gupshop, we've raised uh, quite a bit of money. So at Upwork, I'm sorry, at Gupshop, we've raised uh, $50 million so far, wow. cumulative. Uh, but, but again, think of it, right? The last round was about 10 years ago. So we've been kind of profitable since then. We've been operating in a very, this is unlike many other tech companies. I think we've been running, you know, like a sustainable business. And uh, now, you know, I think we are looking at uh, raising more money to scale up even faster and, and so on. So I think, uh, but, but yeah, it's important to, you know, be able to build uh, scale sustainable businesses 
because that allows you to you know invest more in business to sort of control your destiny you, you know you don't do optimize for the short term you can think longer term and scale it up yeah and what was it like you know back 10 years ago uh or I mean, even before that when you did acquire capital or require funding sorry when you did acquire funding what was the process like trying to attract those investors was it after you received a lot of traction on the product, after they, you started to see a lot of success because then it was a lot easier to attract the right type of investors? Or were you able to get funding before, um, before you were even you know, getting successful traction on the, uh, on the application, on the system? Oh, you know, there were multiple rounds of funding. So the answer is all of the above, right? I mean, obviously in the, you know, the seed, stage of funding is is really just people are betting on the team, right? The team and the idea, because mm-hmm. all it is is a PowerPoint deck and so on. But uh, successive rounds, then they're looking at least for a product, right? And then after that, of course, product and traction, uh, customer adoption and so on, right? So, and in addition to that, we've had to, you know, uh, occasionally do pivots as well, right? I mean, you change, you're going in one direction, it's not working, now you need to change course. Um, so ultimately, you know, I think you want to raise money from investors that understand how these things go. I mean, sometimes, you know, what you think you would start with is not where you end up and uh, they need to be, um, you know, they need to have perspective uh, themselves. I mean, if you have investors that get anxious with these kind of, you know, changes, uh, then that, that's not going to uh, work either. So, so we were fortunate enough to get, you know, n- not just get funding, but get funding from the right kind of people that would be supportive, understanding, um, and s- the same thing, right? When something doesn't work, okay, what didn't work? How would we fix it? What else could we do differently? What is, you know, what are the things that are working? Uh, you know, you do more of that and scale the other stuff. So, so it's really, you know, it's a fundraising can be tricky and yeah, the unfortunate thing is uh, uh, sometimes, you know, people who really need it but have no track record, then it's hard uh, for them to do any fundraising and later on when they're successful, uh, you know, and don't need money, they'll, everybody's willing to give them money, right? So it's a little bit of a, a feast and famine uh, kind of uh, sort of dynamic there, but uh, but that's because it's inherently risky, right? So you really, when, when it's a completely unknown entity and an entrepreneur, I mean, you really don't know how they'll react in different situations. Yeah. So that's why oftentimes, you know, uh, people with a track record uh, find it easier, right? So then the question is, how does somebody break in? And I think they're, you know, I mean, if you for a young entrepreneur, sometimes if they, have tried and found it difficult. One option is to actually work in in some other startup, you know, sort of uh, learn the tricks of the trade, uh, build relationships, because almost always, uh, you know, uh, the, the relationships lead to newer business interactions and so on. Uh, you know, exactly because it's such a deeply personal exercise, uh, right? You really have to know that that person has the uh, has the ability, you know, and the agility and the nimbleness and the grit and determination and the intelligence to be able to deal with whatever the startup journey throws at them. You know? I love it. No, you're, you're so right. It's a very, very true. You know, and, you know, I think this is actually a good segue because I, I do have a few more questions, but um, I want to talk, be rude about a little bit about the struggle that you've, um, you've probably seen other, you know, business leaders, other CEOs, other entrepreneurs go through as well, uh, along with some of the things that you've gone through, the, some of the obstacles and struggles that you've experienced as well. Can you name some of the, your toughest challenges um, that you and even other people um, have gone through that's very similar? Like, have you been going through some similar obstacles and challenges that some of other uh, you know, business leaders and entrepreneurs have also gone through? And how have you really overcome them? Oh, yeah, I think, you know, so I'd say for any business, any startup in particular, I think uh, maybe the toughest challenge is a, is a near death. And I mean, a business death experience, right? right. Uh, and businesses can die for a variety of reasons. Um, the commonest usually is just running out of funds, right? Um, but or and, and that happens again, because, you know, maybe 
you can't build a product or you can't assemble a team or you know it's the customers aren't adopting it or it's not scaling fast enough and you can't get new investors and you're not profitable yet and you're burning cash you know day after day and so on yeah. I mean, those are those are things that are sort of at least somewhat in your control uh, but sometimes it can even be external factors right i mean when let's say the uh, the market collapses right where it's impossible to get new funding and you know a lot of cost uh, businesses stop spending money right and on a new product and so on right so in 2001 2008 you know uh, maybe even last year in some industries i mean these are sort of external shocks that you know are through no fault of yours can Im really impact businesses quite significantly right so those are the the toughest challenges and i've i've gone through those uh, multiple times i mean i've lived through you know um, all of these financial crises that I talked about, as well as uh, sort of internal uh, pivots where, you know, something just wasn't working and we had to completely change course. Uh, those can be, uh, or kind of nearly running out of cash and so on, right? Those can be uh, really uh, challenging, you know, uh, sort of gut-wrenching situations. I mean, they really, uh, even for the most experienced entrepreneur, they can be uh, really cause, uh, you know, uh, sleepless nights and, and a ton of stress and anxiety, right? And, and the way to deal with it, I guess, uh, uh, you know, at least the, a, a couple of things, right? One is uh, I've, I've found, uh, you know, there's something called the serenity prayer, which is, you know, uh, give me the, the, the courage to change the things I can. That's true. Uh, the yeah, patient. I know that prayer. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm aware of it. Okay. Yeah. patience to accept the things I can't and the wisdom to know the difference, right? So you don't worry about things outside your control. You focus on the things that are in your control, what you can do, how you react, how you respond to it and so on. And then, you know, your team, your employees look at it, your potential investors look at it, um, you know, and th there are different scenarios, right? In one case, we had enough cash, but the business, but the, when the 2000 crisis hit, so we had to sort of cut back on the team. We had to cut back on the projects. We switched from consumer side to enterprise side. Um, a lot of those things. I think even at uh, Gupshop, we had to pivot from one kind of business to another um, and uh, refocus and so on. And in every one of these cases, right? I mean, there's you. It's not just you, but you have to take your team along, and it can be a lot of dispute, debate, and and stuff like that. And I think even there just being authentic, being honest with the team saying, look, you know, this is what we know. I mean, it may be stressful. I don't like it either, but it is what it is. You know, what are we going to do about it now? Right. Not uh, sort of, uh, so, so I think that's super critical to, uh, to deal with. So yeah, I think some of these take, take time and take effort, um, you know, uh, and, and just a lot of stress, but that's where the grit, the determination, the perseverance, uh sort of really matters yeah i love it thank you very much for that that was a uh, a great answer i think a lot of people will really learn from that uh, very very inspiring thank you so much uh, virud so this is my my last question this is a perfect segue for this as well is for all that you've been through virud your successes your your um, you know the failures just through the entire journey your your career how would you define your story in just one word? If you had to choose one word to define your story. Uh, wow. Well, I would, uh, I think I would just boil it down to grit, um, you know, and uh, now, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, look, um, I was, for example, I was blessed with an exceptional academic background, you know, so I could say uh, smarts could be important. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the funny thing is in business, you're not solving calculus problems every day, right? I mean, it's really not that complex. It needs a lot more um, EQ. It needs a lot more, you know, just, just I mean, to me, really, the word it boils down to is, uh, you know, uh, grit, determination, perseverance to, you know, keep at it. Uh, I might that alone is not enough, but that's really the most important factor because that leads to other things. You don't, you know, you're always thinking, uh, you're thinking differently, what can I do and so on. So I think uh, it really, uh, yeah, uh, that, that's the, if I had to pick one word, that would be it. Yeah. Love it. Awesome. 
And uh, be rude. Where can everyone find you? Your, uh, I guess, you know, website or, or social media. Or where's the best uh, best place for everyone to find you? Yeah, I mean, I'm very, you know, the the fringe benefit of an unusual name like mine <laughs> is that I get it on every namespace without having to add any numbers or anything to it. Uh, it's just be rude. Uh, it's at whether on Twitter, on Gmail, on almost, uh, you know, on Facebook, I mean, any namespace, even on Google, you'll only find one of me. So I'm not very hard to find. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was an honor. I really appreciate it. Be rude. And uh, again, this is Michael Giorgio, your host on Tales from the Pros. And until next time, thank you, everyone. Please subscribe to our YouTube page and also follow our social media. Uh, there are links somewhere around here, but uh, we really appreciate it, guys. Thanks for all the support, and I'm going to be giving you awesome content continuously, and we look forward to seeing you soon.